All right, Eric, so I was looking at the show outline, and we have a lot to cover today. So we need to stay focused, keep our eyes on the ball, and stop the clowning around. The listener deserves better than to hear me talking and talking and going on and on before the show even starts. So without any further nonsense, tomfoolery, or hijinks, I present to you the greatest podcast in the world, the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Thank you for joining us on the 75th episode of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. We're the Internet's premier resource for reviews and commentary about vintage paperback fiction in the crime, adventure, western, and spy genres, with occasional forays into other fictions as well. If you made it this far, you know that we have a podcast that airs every Monday, but we also have a blog with daily reviews and a deep, deep archive at paperbackwarrior.com. My name is Eric. And I'd like to bring on my co-host, Tom, to tell us about this episode. Thank you, Eric. This is going to be one of those episodes with a lot of mini topics filled with filled in with odds and ends that we need to discuss. But I'm going to do a short feature segment discussing an interesting adult Western series called the Canyon O'Grady series, written under the house name of John Sharp. And this is going to appeal to both fans of Western, but also crime and historical fiction enthusiasts. For reviews this episode, I'm going to be tackling Brute Madness by LeDru Baker Jr. Eric, what are you reviewing today? I'm going to be giving the listeners their red meat. I'm going to be reviewing the second novel in the Able Team series. Oh, wow. Okay, good. That's <laughs> going to be popular. The Hostaged Island Nice. Yeah. Outstanding. Now, before we get into all that, you have undertaken a large project involving your home library. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? Um, yeah. So, yeah, large project. So, Tom, you and I have talked about, uh, well, both on and off the air, about bagging books. And for the longest time, we both agreed that we aren't collectors or readers, but we didn't really care about first editions or who the artist was on the covers. We both probably agree that our kids and spouses are not going to continue to keep our libraries when we both choke to death on artichoke cards. My books will probably be at the closest thrift store for a dime each. No, they're going to be in my house because I'm going to outlive your ass. <laughs> yeah, you probably are. So the idea of bagging is uh, rather nagging. So, uh, But as years go by and I've started to change my thinking, I love reading physical books. I, I would say 90% of what I read are physical books. Interesting. Um, and I don't want my books to be rags years from now and I'm still trying to squint to read the fine print. And I don't want my books to become more yellow and moldy than they already are. But here's the biggest reason why I've decided to bag my books. I work from home in my office surrounded by these old books. Oh, I see where this is going. <laughs> and you know what, Tom? My office stinks. It smells like a used, nasty bookstore in my office. And I used to think that that was a really, really great smell. Charming. <laughs> and it, it meant that I was getting really close to getting new acquisitions for my library. Now I just absolutely hate the smell. And my wife was kind enough to buy a few bags for me. And I used them. And then I was thinking, well, I'll just reorder several hundred more. And I've taken on the tedious job of bagging up each book. I'm even using tape to tape them shut on the back. And uh, so far it's been a rather easy thing to do. And what I do is I mostly do it when I have my long-winded Medicare customers on the phone. <laughs> and they're telling me about their grandkids and their first few weeks of marriage way back in 1965, and I just bag and listen. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that, that's it. So I once mentioned on the show that I was not enthusiastic about bagging my paperbacks, and then I received an email from Greg Shepard, the owner of Stark House Books, and he said that his home in California is in a redwood tree grove, and he attributes that to damage caused in his library. Uh, Greg cited a problem called foxing. Have you ever heard of this phenomenon of foxing? Eric? I've heard of that term, but I'm not sure what it actually does to the books. I had to look it up. So foxing is an age-related process of deterioration that causes spots and browning on old paper. The name likely comes from the reddish-brown color of the stains. It basically, to me, looks like rust on paper. Now, Greg attributes his foxing problem of his library to the dust and moisture from this redwood forest he lives in. But Wikipedia says that the causes of foxing remain a mystery and the source of great debate. One theory is that it's a fungal infection of the paper. 
Another theory is that it's caused by the oxidation of iron or copper or other trace substances in the pulp from which the paper is made. Everyone seems to agree, though, that humidity is the envy. I assume that by bagging the books, it's going to eliminate foxing? Yeah, no, foxing? I suppose that's what Greg's point was. And so Greg gives me some fatherly advice that he hates bagging books and having his library in bags just like I do. But he says he learned this hard and expensive lesson when much of his library got foxed. Despite that, I'm not going to bother with it. My library, we're here right now recording, is in a temperature-controlled room in my house. Most of these books have lasted since the 1950s or 1960s without bags. And candidly, I don't really care what happens to them when I'm dead. In the unlikely event that you outlive me, Eric, you can bag them up because I'm not doing it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um I mean, let me ask you something, though. Yeah. And this is actually a dilemma of mine, and, and this is funny. I, I can't figure out if I want to waste a 10-cent bag on books like Gunsmith or Trailsman or, or even like Mac Bolin books. I mean, these are newer books, and they don't smell particularly bad. But at the same time, I want uniformity. I want all the books to have bags. I'm so confused on this. Yeah, your library is going to look like all hell if half your books are bagged, the other half aren't. So you need to decide how how important eye appeal is to you. And um, and you know these Gunsmith and Trailsman and Mac Boland books are not getting any younger. Yeah, and they're so yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, even a, a Mac Boland book from the '80s now that's what 40 years old. And so if, yeah. if you're truly worried that the rotting paper is going to get into your nose and give you like ass cancer <laughs> right. or something like. Yeah. <laughs> you, may, you may just want to bag them up. It, uh, you know, the, um, the, uh, the um, I guess you call them the gothic plantations or the slave plantation yeah, novels. Yeah, yeah. They're too big for the bags. So i got to buy bigger, thicker bags for those because they're so thick. They won't fit in the bags. You could like saran wrap them with rubber bands. <laughs> Maybe. I don't them. know. Uh, any final thoughts on bagging or can I move on to my next topic? That's it. Let's move okay, on. So I have this quick story I want to share about something that happened to me. And it's a little embarrassing, but I think our listeners may find it interesting. Yeah, we'd love to hear a story that embarrasses you. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, by way of background, there was a used bookstore on the Hawaiian island of Oahu called Jellies that went out of business in 2015. At the time, I lived in Hawaii, and I made a deal with the store owner to buy his entire inventory of paperbacks in the Long Arm series of adult westerns, very cheap. It was like $40 for more than 200 books. Now, for the uninitiated, Long Arm was a Western series that debuted in 1978. The author on the cover was Tabor Evans, and there is no such person as Tabor Evans. Instead, it was a house name utilized by several authors to produce one book per month until the publisher stopped releasing them in 2015. Now, the real authors include several of my all-time favorites, including Lou Cameron, who invented the series and wrote a ton of the early ones, as well as Chet Cunningham, James Reasoner, Peter Brandvold, who wrote a bunch of the later ones. Even Harry Whittington wrote a handful of them. The books all stand alone quite nicely, and they're about a deputy U.S. Marshal named Custis Long, based in Denver. Now, every book, he's given an assignment in the Old West, and the best books serve as kind of mysteries or crime novels set in uh, the Old West. What makes them adult westerns is that the publisher required the author to include at least two very graphic sex scenes per book. Now, different authors did a better job than others with that aspect of the novels, and I think there were 436 installments of Long Arm and 30 Long Arm giant books. By my calculation, it looked like Custis Long got laid uh, upwards of about a thousand times um, um, in uh, with about that many women also. So he was putting up some Wilt chamberlain size <laughs> yeah, numbers. Right. So anyway, that's who Long Arm is. Okay, so if I'm following you, you became the proud owner of between 200 uh, long arm books in 2015. Is that right? Yeah, between 200 and 300, and uh, at, a, at a very nice price. Yeah. So about a year later, I moved to Florida and set up this home readers library for myself, and I proudly shelved all of my long arm books in numerical order right over there. Over the past five years, I read about 20 or 30 of them, and I enjoyed them quite a bit. They're formulaic as hell, um, but they're also way better than they look. The upshot, though, is that I burned out on reading long arms, and they were taking up a lot of valuable space in my library um, at the shelves here. So I carefully placed them into boxes to decide what to do with them, and I was thinking of finding someone who wanted them and, and, um, or, and maybe even just giving them away because they really don't have a financial value. They're not worth much, and I really didn't pay that much for them, so I didn't feel like I was like financially invested in the long arms. 
Anyway, so they sat in boxes for a few weeks, and then I decided to try to sell them. I didn't want to sell them individually because that would take forever, and I didn't think there was a market for anybody who wanted to buy 200 adult westerns in one lot. Now, as an aside, my wife has this weird habit of saving shoe boxes after any one of us in my family buys shoes. So we have this closet filled with shoe boxes <laughs> for reasons after 23 years of marriage still remain unclear to me. So I grabbed two shoe boxes and I saw that they hold 20 long arm paper bags each per shoe box. And so I loaded 20 uh, long arms in a shoe box and I took photos of the content of two different shoe boxes and I put them on sale on eBay in a seven day auction. And each box got me about $25 each. And I sent the shoe box to the lucky winners. And now I had $50 burning a hole in my pocket. Stay with me. So I do this again. Two more shoe boxes and two more auctions. These two got me $30 per shoe box. One guy paid right away and the other guy did not. Now, by this time in the story, it's the week of December 15. And the lines at the post office were insane. I needed to send the one shoebox to the guy who paid right away, but I didn't want to go to the post office for a second time um, after the other guy paid. So I've been using eBay since like 1999, and my rating is 1,300. And this means I've had 1,300 successful transactions where neither the buyer nor the seller got screwed over. In fact, I, Eric, I have never had an eBay transaction go bad. I always get paid, and I always get the stuff that I order. So I go to the post office and send out both shoe boxes. One I had been paid for already. The other I had not. That's bold. And I was betting that the guy who had not paid me would do the right thing and pay for the books without him knowing that they were already en route, right? I didn't want him to know that. Yeah. So I sent him some messages on uh, eBay reminding him to pay, and it's just nothing. It's crickets from this guy. Yeah. I check his eBay rating, and it's only like eight, but that's eight transactions over the past 12 months that were successful, and no bad ones. Nothing had gone sideways with this guy. As day after day goes by, I'm becoming more and more annoyed that I've heard nothing from this guy, and I've already sent the books. I mean, like, how many calories am I going to burn to get $30 (laughs) from Floyd Fournier Jr. of Laramie, Wyoming? That was his name. So anyway, so I look up the guy on Facebook, and there he is with a profile, and he's doing fundraising for St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, and there's lots of Jesus content in his uh, Facebook page, who's clearly this devout Christian. So I send him a Facebook message. And again, I'm really nice and polite. Maybe the eBay notifications are getting hung up in his spam folder or something, and he's a religious guy, so it's unlikely that he's going to rip me off, right? Still nothing. No response from Floyd. So I Google Floyd Fournier Jr. of Laramie, Wyoming, and what's the first thing that pops up? He's a registered sex offender. He raped a girl under the age of 13 sometime in his past. And so I'm thinking this guy may not have any moral qualms about burning me for 20 sexy Western paperbacks. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, uh, I'm also rattled that I evidently have the same literary taste as a child rapist. <laughs> oh, my God. So what, what do you think so far this time? Uh, only you, man. Only you. Well, here's the thing, though. If, if he was a child rapist, it makes sense that he has a lot of Jesus content, right? All this religious stuff and, and the positive things about donating to St. Jude's and so forth. In my experience, when guys go bad and they hit rock bottom, that's when they finally see the light. And, and I'm a Christian. I totally get God humbling someone so much that they're on their knees before you know changing directions. I get that. But at the same time, though, he is getting his fix off of sex through literature. And that's, that's just insane. Um, so are you going to keep pursuing this guy or just give up? I don't know. I mean, there's only so much I can do. I'm going to give him a bad eBay rating to like warn off the next person. I'm, I'm, go- you know, I'm going to stop emailing him and messaging him because that's clearly falling on deaf ears. He may be in, in jail for all I know. Um, but I'm thinking maybe I should send the rest of my long arms to only registered sex <laughs> offenders so they can get their rocks off with dirty Westerns instead of <laughs> flesh and blood victims. Anyway, if you're listening, Floyd, Godspeed. You won this round. Congratulations. Enjoy the long arms on me, and, uh, and I hope you don't rip off anyone the way you ripped off me. Anyway, so before we do our feature, you mentioned that you had an old friend of yours who you converted to a vintage paperback reader. Why don't you tell me the story about that? Because uh, we didn't really get into it too deeply when we were texting. Yeah, exactly. So I've been uh, longtime friends with a guy named Greg, 
and we go, gosh, we go back. Um, we both worked at a music and video store like 20 some odd years ago, and we've remained friends ever since. And Greg and I mostly formed our friendship around music and horror books and movies. Uh, Greg is my go-to guy for uh, Victorian horror and, and stuff like H.P. Lovecraft. He's a really smart guy, and he can read Latin, and he's into some really abstract stuff. And, uh, Greg, and also, uh, Greg and I also were writing partners at times because we both contributed for a music blog called MaximumMetal.com. Uh, anywho, Greg has never, never been into the stuff we talk about here on Paperback Warrior. He's not a crime noir guy. He's not a crime fiction guy. He's he's not a men's action adventure sort of fan. In that regard, he's basically me prior to 2013. Horror and comics and that sort of thing was you know, mostly all we were reading. But over the last few years, Greg would send me a message asking what I've been up to, what I've been watching and reading, and so forth. My response has always been something crime noir related or an adventure novel or, or what have you. Up until about six months ago, Greg had no interest in crime noir. But one day he sends me a message and uh, he surprised me, Tom. And I'm going to read parts of the email that uh, he sent me. Oh, cool. Yeah, so he says in his email, Vintage crime fiction was a genre that I was relatively unfamiliar with until the last few months when I read The Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler Interesting. and The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. I went on a big film noir binge, and after watching movies like Double Indemnity, The Postman Always Rings Twice, The Big Combo, and others, I was curious if any of them were adapted from books. After some research and a reminder from a friend, me, I found the Paperback Warrior website and the podcast. Thanks to you and Tom, I've learned a great deal more, not only about crime fiction, but about vintage paperbacks in general, and have developed what is now becoming a growing obsession that is sure to blossom into a full-blown pastime. I've already read a handful of these books, and here are some of my thoughts. And he goes on to list the books and uh, his capsule reviews, and I'm going to touch on a few of those. Uh, and they're interesting. The first is The Captain Must Die by Robert Colby. Now, Tom, that was one of your oh, favorite books. God, I love that book. Yeah. So Greg says that uh, that this book was absolutely excellent. Uh, he says the writing was fantastic and that uh, Colby did an excellent job conveying the sense of deep-seated hatred and loathing within the main antagonist. The fact that each of the five main characters all have an opportunity to have their voices heard is something that is thoroughly enjoyed, and the use of the literary flashbacks to add to the history between all the characters was fantastic. The story was full of twists and turns and a maddening need to find out what secret was being kept in the secret room. Yes. The second book he read was one that I had reviewed called Death House Daw by Day Keen. We actually talked about this book a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, so Greg describes the book as an enjoyable read with a constant furious pace that rarely lets up. He said it was a very different yet very pleasant take on a private eye styled short story. Uh, another one was The Case of the Cop's Wife by Milton Ozaki. You remember oh, that Yeah, one? that was so good. Yeah. He, he, he's a weird dude, but <laughs> man, he wrote a good book there. <laughs> uh, he said it felt like it was right up there with the uh, 87th Precinct books, which he just started to read. Uh, he said he's going to find more books by Ozaki. Second to last is another book that I reviewed called Color Him Dead by Charles Runyon. Uh, he said it took him a little while to get into this book, but once he did, it was really enjoyable. He describes it as a mix of romance and action, with the author weaving in the past wrongs and loves of the characters and what happens when things don't go according to plan. He uh, says he's added Charles Runyon to his list of authors to search for. And last is Drawn to Evil by Harry Whittington. Um, I think you I think you re reviewed that one, didn't you? I have read so many Whittington oh, books. Drawn to Evil. Yeah, I did I, I, that one maybe not maybe, maybe. Not have been the best. No, no, no. Uh, Greg says that it lulled him into a false sense of security, but only to pull the rug out from under him right near the end. Okay, good. Right. Uh, so I remember not liking it as much either. Yeah, he says he found himself actually yelling at the main character several times while reading the book because of the choices he made or things that he said or did. Uh, he says that Whittington takes what seems to be a straightforward mystery and adds a grim twist near the end that caught him completely off guard. Uh, Tom, I like hearing things like this um, from some of our li listeners and fans, and, and Greg in particular, because it reflects the same sort of experience that I had, you know, gosh, back in 2017 when you first introduced me to Crime Noir, and I had no idea what the genre was until you loaned me a few books, and I feel like we've done the same sort of service for Greg. I think his testimony here is a great message for our listeners. If you are new to these types of books and authors, or maybe sort of outside of the circle and not knowing if Crime Noir is really your thing... Trust me when I say that Greg had absolutely no interest in this genre six months ago. 
These old books and these authors are timeless, and they can create so much joy and excitement once you give them a try. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks, Greg, for listening to our show and for delving into unfamiliar territory to try something new. And uh, Greg, I also encourage us to do shows on H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard. Uh, but I'm, I'm not opposed to that. I do need to do more, more reading to kind of get up to speed. But yeah. it's also validating to hear from a listener and or reader that they're affirming the books that we liked and that we got yeah. turned. So it's not, it's not just us living in this bubble. These, right. these are books that people outside of our, our little nerd group of two here really do enjoy. So yeah. that's nice. Right. Uh, any other odds and ends before we launch into the feature? That's it. That's all, that's all I had. Okay, so transition music, por favor. Our feature today is the Canyon O'Grady adult western series, written under the house name of John Sharp. There were 25 books in the series between 1989 and 1993, all published by Signet. Now, if the name John Sharp rings a bell, Eric, you have a good ear for details. It's also the same house name used for the Trailsman series, starring Sky Fargo, that ran for 398 installments, lasting from 1980 to 2014. Trailsman was one of the most successful adult Western series titles ever. Most of the early Trailsman books were written by a guy named John Messman, who also wrote the Revenger series and the Jefferson Boone Handyman series but he's also good for probably about 100 of the Trailsman books. Later installments of the Trailsman series are mostly written by David Robbins, who also wrote the End World books. Dozens of other authors also wrote Trailsman books, including James Reasoner, Ed Gorman, Robert Randizi, and Stephen Mertz. So a lot of the best adventure fiction authors alive have have been John Sharp at one time or another. So Canyon O'Grady was Signet Book's attempt at leveraging the popularity of the Trailsman series and the John Sharp name by creating a spin-off character, like the way that Laverne and Shirley and Mork and Mindy were both spin-offs of Happy Days. That makes sense. Yeah. So the premise behind the Canyon O'Grady series is very different from the other Western series titles, which is why I want to tell you about them today. You see, Canyon O'Grady is not some drifting do-gooder hero like the Trailsman or the Gunsmith. Instead, he is a U.S. government agent who gets his investigative assignments directly from U.S. President James Buchanan. That's unique. Yeah. Now, when asked the difference between what a federal marshal and a U.S. government agent, Canyon O'Grady explains as follows. A federal marshal arrests people and brings them in. Sometimes he does some law keeping. Mostly, though, he is the arresting arm of the federal government, whereas a government agent tracks down trouble and troublemakers anywhere and everywhere. Federal marshals have a territory. I go anywhere the trail takes me. For instance, in book two, President Buchanan asked Canyon to protect the man working on this new invention called the machine gun before the device falls into the wrong hands. In book number 12, Railroad Renegades, a motley crew of assassins known as the Blue Goose Gang, plans to cut short the president's career with a bullet, and it's up to Canyon O'Grady to protect the chief executive as he rides the rails to a meeting with fate. So this hero, Canyon O'Grady, is not in the prairie fighting Apaches like in a normal Western. He's basically taking on historical fiction adventures in the Old West at the behest of the President of the United States. What do you think? Cool premise? Very. Yeah. And so as far as background on the main character, Canyon was conceived in Ireland and born in the U.S. His father was an Irish revolutionary fleeing British rule with a price on his head. Canyon was classically educated by wise and learned Catholic monks, and he often quotes Greek poets and sings Irish folk songs in the books. He rides this beautiful Palomino horse named Cormac, um, named after the Irish king of the 8th century. Another interesting thing is that Signet Books was trying to create their own little Marvel universe with these two John Sharp series titles. In Trailsman number 87 and Trailsman number 100, 
Both of those books are team-ups between Sky Fargo and Canyon O'Grady. Now, both of those books were also written by John Messman, who created both series titles. Which brings us to the authors of the Canyon O'Grady series. I did a bunch of research with the U.S. Copyright Office database, and assuming that none of the authors subcontracted this work out to other ghostwriters, here's who wrote the Canyon O'Grady books. Number one was the first book, is Dead Man's Trails. It was written by John Messman. Now, this made sense because he invented the Canyon O'Grady series, and he also invented the Trailsman series. Now, Messman also wrote books number two and four of the Canyon O'Grady series, and then he was done. Book three was written by Chet Cunningham, who at the time was also writing the Spur adult western series, as, and he also wrote the Penetrator books. Chet also wrote books 5 through 12 of Canyon O'Grady. Now, see, books 13 and 15 were written by a Western author named Will C. Knott. I haven't read those particular installments of Canyon O'Grady, but I've never read a good book by Will C. Oh, Knott. Geez. I think he's a real no talent. Ah. So I am just done with that guy. I've read, I've read plenty of books by him, and they're all, they're all terrible. Canyon O'Grady books 14 and 16 were written by Mark K. Roberts. And it's interesting is that he wrote the other half of the Penetrator books that weren't written by Chet Cunningham. Yeah. It's a very incestuous world of uh, paperback fiction back then. Yeah. And so then we have Canyon O'Grady books 17 through 25. The last nine books in the series were all written by Robert Randese, the author of the Gunsmith adult western series. Now, many people have told me that those were the best books in the Canyon O'Grady series. Now, God knows Robert Randese certainly knows his way around the world of adult westerns, because, uh, again, he was the gunsmith guy. Uh, Randese told me that he enjoyed writing the Canyon O'Grady books more than he liked writing the Trailsman installments that he authored. Because these books are adult westerns, Canyon O'Grady takes uh, two timeouts per book to have graphic sex with women he encounters in the novels. And if sex scenes bother you, you can easily skip them uh, because very rarely are they incorporated much with the story itself. Uh, you can read the series in absolutely any order and because there's no particular continuity between books, nor is there an origin story. I can definitely recommend book number one in the series, uh, Dead Man's Trails by John Messman. This one takes place along the wild and lawless Ken- uh, Kentucky-Tennessee border in 1959, where Canyon goes undercover on a special assignment from the president involving the mysterious death of Meriwether Lewis, of Lewis and Clark fame 50 years earlier. It's basically a cold case homicide that becomes a manhunt and a treasure hunt. Shortly after his arrival in the small Kentucky town, Canyon witnesses a targeted murder of a man who may have answers involving Lewis's death. It turns out that a bunch of people have been getting assassinated in this book because of something they know about this mystery of the past. The intensity of the violence in this book sometimes actually approached the level of the Edge series uh, because there was a lot of bullets flying and blood flowing. And the central mystery regarding these assassinations I thought was really compelling in this pulpy paperback. So this Canyon O'Grady series debut, really great. I totally recommend it. Again, it's Dead Men's Trails, written by John Messman, uh, but it's only ever been published under the name John Sharp. Another installment I want to recommend is called The Lincoln Assignment. It was the fifth book in the series. It was written by Chet Cunningham in 1989. In this one, someone is trying to kill U.S. Representative Abraham Lincoln before a series of debates with U.S. Senator Stephen Douglas as both men compete for the Senate seat held by Douglas. Meanwhile, a team of deadly assassins is also targeting Senator Douglas, who has his eye winning, on, winning the White House in two years. The current U.S. president in this book is James Buchanan. He's concerned about this threat to the democratic process, and he dispatches his best man, special agent Canyon O'Grady, to Illinois to investigate and neutralize the threat. I've always preferred Chet Cunningham's work in the Western genre to his contemporary paperbacks. For instance, I think the Spur books are better than the Penetrator books. And this Canyon O'Grady book is no exception. It's really great. And Abe Lincoln is a character in an action novel. So what more would yeah, you want? Yeah. That's, it's great. Again, the book's called The Lincoln Assignment by Chet Cunningham, writing as John Sharp. 
Anyway, I really like the series, and I'm sorry it didn't take off. I wish it had uh, been more successful. I think the idea of plunging a hero into adventures, co-starring real-life historical figures from time to time, was really innovative. They're way better than the Trailsman books that I've read, and I didn't care much for the Trailsman books at all, but I may need to read the two crossover installments because I just love the idea of characters from different series titles coming together in a single adventure. The downside with the series is that it's owned and operated by Signet Publishing, not the authors. So Signet's owned by New American Library, who is owned by Penguin Random House, uh, a corporate conglomerate formed in 2013 when Penguin and Random House merged. The corporation owns 365 different book imprints today. As a result, this giant corporation cares nothing about their Canyon O'Grady intellectual property. The chances of them being reprinted are precisely zero. And uh, moreover, but the chances of anyone who decides to take it upon themselves to make this series available is going to get swarmed by corporate lawyers. That's 100% accurate. Yeah. So if you want to read or collect the Canyon O'Grady books, you're stuck with used paperback markets. Uh, fortunately, I haven't found the series to be particularly scarce or expensive. The going rate on eBay seems to be about $5 per book, so it's worth a shot. I uh, just hope that you win the auction uh, before Floyd the child molester <laughs> snatches them all up in Wyoming. Oh, Anyway, that's all I got. I want to thank Steve Mayow uh, of the Western Fiction Review blog for helping me out with researching uh, this feature. So, Eric, why don't you serve up a review for the listener? Yeah, so uh, on episode 32 of this show, which aired way back in February of last year, I reviewed the debut Able Team novel Tower of Terror. In that episode, I explained that the Able Team series consisted of 51 books as an offshoot of the Mac Bolan Executioner series. Tower of Terror was released in 1982, and I hated it. I thought it went absolutely nowhere and bored me to tears. But as I mentioned earlier, I own almost a complete set of Able Team now, so I can't throw in the towel after only one attempt. Uh, so I chose the series' second installment, The Hostage Island, to review here on the show. It was authored by both L.R. Payne and a guy named Norman Winsky. Do you remember Norman Winsky? Yes, he wrote the Hitman books, right? Yeah, yeah. I reviewed a couple of those on yeah. the on the paperbackwarrior.com blog. The Hostage Island has hundreds of psychotic and heavily armed bikers invading Catalina Island off the coast of Los Angeles. These bikers are literally ready to rape the whole island. Nice. Yeah. Their demand is that the US government provide them 20 million in gold on a nuclear submarine. Uh, and, of course, the government refuses. And the telephone rings at Stony Man Farm for Able Team to come become involved. Like many of the Mac Bolan Universe books, the Hostage Island doesn't concentrate solely on the heroic trio of Able Team. Instead, the authors do sort of like this really cool diehard sort of vibe with a handful of the islanders trying to avoid capture. While most of the island is being held captive in a local gymnasium, this handful of ordinary citizens hops from house to house and street to street trying to avoid the biker's net. Now, of course, there's Able Team, and the authors fit them into the storyline perfectly. I thought the idea of the team working together to secretly raft onto the island was really exciting. I love the team doing some long-range sniping and generally just crushing these untrained, fat, boozy bikers. It's totally juvenile 80s action, and I loved every second of it. If you can turn your brain off and just relish in the zany, over-the-top antics, the hostage island is a ton of fun. I personally suggest it, Tom. Good. Tell me who the authors were, or again, the actual authors. Uh, that's L.R. Payne and Norman Winsky. Do some homework for me at some point. I believe that L.R. Payne is the same person as G.H. Frost, who, uh, al- who also yeah. wrote some Able Team books, including the so. one that you need to read and review, Army of Devils. I just got that, yeah. Yeah, if you want zany and over the top, <laughs> just read the first page of Army of Devils <laughs> okay. and see what actually happens in that is first it, page. Is this a zombie book? Um, like, like well, it's it's that type. Of, it's that okay. type. Of, they're not literal zombies, okay. but they're um, they're just like lunatics on a college campus, like lopping people's arms off and stuff. <laughs> okay. uh, we at some point need to peel the onion on who this G. H. Frost slash L. R. Payne person is, right. because there's there's something there that I don't quite have my hands around. Um, yeah, but so, just an amazingly vivid writer. My review is of a 1961 book called Brute Madness by Ledru Baker. Ledru Schupman Baker Jr. lived from 1919 to 1967. He was born in Kansas and died in Los Angeles at age 48. He was a painter, novelist, and World War II veteran 
who also authored two successful Fawcett Gold Medal books in 1951 and 1952, as well as this espionage novel called Brute Madness, released by a low-end sleaze publisher called Novel Books, which was based in Chicago back in 1961. Fortunately, you don't have to seek out the sleaze book. You can uh, buy the um, paper. You can buy a new edition from Cutting Edge Books, who has rescued this novel from the dustbin of history. The paperback opens with our narrator Mark Mitch Mitchell on trial for stealing a classified technical report on atomic guided missile technology from his employer at the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. Flashbacks from the trial tell the backstory and how this patriotic young scientist who worked on the Manhattan Project suddenly finds himself on trial for treason. Essentially, Derek, it's blame the dame. Ah, Mitch has an eye for the ladies. He meets Marie at a dance club. From the moment they meet, there's this erotic compatibility that the author describes in vivid but never graphic detail. Suffice to say that Mitch is completely intoxicated by Marie. Now, three weeks after they met, Mitch and Marie are engaged to be married. Now, the internal security people at the Atomic Energy Commission are skeptical of Marie from the beginning. Why can't they find out anything about this girl's past? It's like she appeared out of nowhere. The marriage moves forward over the protests of the agency's internal security guys. You don't have to draw, be a genius to draw a straight line between the opening courtroom scene with Mitch on trial for mishandling classified materials and the flashback involving his suspicious wife who materialized into his life from nowhere. Is it possible that Marie duped Mitch and made off with secret missile plans? The trajectory of the legal case in this novel is, um, in the first quarter of the book, was absolutely ridiculous, and it made me wonder if the author had ever been in court or even met an attorney. There was nothing about the legal process that made sense. But if you're able to suspend your disbelief about that, there's really a great spy thriller inside the pages of the thin paperback. Lots of unexpected twists and turns around every corner. The main villain is this giant fat guy who reminded me of the kingpin from... Um, from Frank Miller's Daredevil books. In this, in this book, is, he's called the, De- the Dutchman, one of the finest villains I've ever encountered in a, in a vintage paperback. Uh, most of the dialogue and the action scenes are particularly good throughout the book. Uh, some of the sex scenes are kind of clunky, but what do I care? Brute Madness by LeDrew Baker was a remarkably good time. It's not going to be your favorite book ever, but it's way better than it had to be coming from a sleaze publisher. Again, it's called Brute Madness by LeDrew Baker Jr. It's available for like a couple bucks from Cutting Edge Press, and uh, it's, it's it's worth your time. Cool. Eric, that was a darn good episode, man. I, I cannot believe we just gave it away for free. It was a good episode, and listeners are welcome to donate to us via PayPal using the link on the desktop version of the paperbackwarrior.com homepage to help us defray the cost of producing this podcast. But the most important thing you can do is come back and listen next week. You can also read our book reviews at the Paperback Warrior site. With that, we'll put a pin in this episode and say see you next week. On behalf of Tom, this is Eric signing off. Be cool.